Oh, I think this must be a recording. Um, anyway, let's 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 go for it. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to Dumb SEO Questions, episode three seven zero. Each week we meet here to review the questions uh, asked and answered on the Dumb SEO Questions Facebook group. Um, with us tonight, we have Masataki Wasa. Masataki is webmaster of wasaweb.net. Uh, he's also a Google product expert uh, in the AdSense community. Uh, he is based at Wimbledon, uh, a suburb of London. And uh, David Razam is uh, also in the UK. Uh, David uh, lives in West Sussex on the sunny south of uh, England. Uh, he um, is a leading internet marketer. Uh, you can find David at davidrazam.com. And Tim Kapper is CEO of onlineownership.com. Uh, he's also a Google product expert in the Google My Business community. Um, you can uh, find Tim at onlineownership.com. He's based in Corby, about 100 miles north of London. We have nine questions tonight. The um, first one, uh, they're all good questions, but the, the first one is when to post you, where, when to post your company's press releases. Let's have a look at that. Um, this is from Andrew Polin. Um, he said, hi, everyone. I'd like to know your opinion on whether to post your company's press releases on the company website after it has been distributed by a PR distribution service, and it's been picked up by media outlets like Yahoo Finance and Market Watch. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, I'm... Yeah, uh, well... Technically, it's your, you actually submitted it, and then you, it's been published, and then you're publishing it on site, I am assuming in a press area or something. Yeah, you can do, but I'd probably no index it. It's just too much of it around. I mean... If it's been picked up and it's live, you know, online, why do you need to have that same thing from your own site? Um, Cutting things up. Yeah, you know, you can put it on site in a press section. I'd probably no index it though. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, a, a, a press release is a press release. It's uh, something to help the dear old board journalists um, turn in their number of words each day. Um, and in many cases, it will just be um, not much more than uh, published verbatim. Um, I, so, so the question is, does it do very much for your site? Well, possibly not. Um, I think I'd, I'd rewrite it. I'd write um, a page about your your new product, your new service, whatever it is, you know, if it's important enough to the world to send out, send out a press release, well, I think it should be written in a way that is right for your um, for your readership, uh, and your readership is unlikely to be uh, journalists. Um, so, I would say, in a in an ideal world, I would. Um, at the very most, um, no follow it, no index it, um, rather. Um, but I would certainly think, well, if it's if it's of interest enough to put out a press release, then it deserves a proper piece of content um, written for your uh, for your audience. Thank you, David. Thank you, Tim. All right, let's um, move on to the next. Um, this one from Olivia Rose. 
How to Choose Long Tail Keywords is the title. Olivia said, hi, everyone. I own a short-term furnished apartment rentals. Uh, I own short-term furnished apartment rentals in South End, Boston. I'm doing keyword research on Google AdWords, and many of my location-based long-tail keywords are so specific that there is no data available because of limited search queries. For example, South End Furnished Rentals, which I think would be an odd an odd thing for people to type. Um, but anyway, um, it's a long tail uh, keyword phrase I'm considering, but it has no search data. Um, should I be only choosing long tail keywords um, with um, enough searches to get data on AdWords? Or is it normal to have long tail keywords with very limited search data? Thank you in advance for your help and time. So, yeah, pretty much long tail keywords, you, you're never really going to find any, you know, search query stuff um, on uh, search, uh, on it. But you should always still be targeting it because, one, um, it's, it's much easier to rank for. But, two, your long tail queries tend to be things around the purchasing funnel. When people are doing uh, research along the way, um, you know, people typically won't wake up and think, um, I'm going to search furnished apartment, right? They also sometimes, you know, over the years, and the way Google has localized search queries, most people have realized they don't need to put in a, a location qualifier into their, their search either. So most people won't wake up and go furnish rentals, right? They're either in one already, they're thinking of moving out, or whatever the case would be. They tend to start doing um, research along the way. They either, they either will probably start researching areas. So you're going to start wanting to provide uh, what's in that particular area, schools, doctors, medical facilities, cost of living, I don't know, all sorts of other things that, you know, people are going to be researching before you move into an area. Um, they probably also do research, like let's say for a newbie who's first moving out, do I want furnished or unfurnished? What's the pros? What's the cons? You know, you need to start providing them uh, people to catch them in their, in, in their research phase and build brand affinity with them. And by the time that actually comes to the point where, right, we're going to start now, start looking at some things, you've already built a brand affinity with them. And assuming you have a decent selection on your site, you know, they will probably come to you and, and book a few viewings. That is the whole point of using long tail and, 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 and targeting people in their purchasing funnel. People don't get up and go furnish rentals. Because depending on what stage they're in, you know, whether they be the first time, whether they are, you know, looking at areas, whether they moving for a job, whatever the case may be, you know, they very, very rarely just sit and go furnish rentals. Um, that's probably the end point. You want to get them all the way in between their different, different research and their different demographical research, you know, on what, what they're going to be searching for. So if it's a family, you're looking at schools, medical, if it's, um, uh, depending on the area, is it a more elderly area? Is it a new gentrified kind of area? So do you want to start looking at, you know, targeting the, the, those kind of people? So. You know, I don't know what kind of area is, but start looking at your demographic and demographic that uses the properties and start intercepting them. Um, and if you're unsure on what these people do, well, you know, ask people when they come to you, you know, when they, when they come into the offices. Just, you know, ask if they've got five minutes to and fire a few questions on them to get some ideas on, on what people are actually thinking about uh, it, you know, to find you or, or, or before they even think of getting a property in that area.
Thank you, Tim. Okay, anybody else on uh, question one on our run list? I have a quick idea. If the person goes to a website called alsoasked.com, and if they enter a couple of search terms, that site will query Google's People Also Ask API, and it will show you the questions that people are asking, or at least the questions that Google is showing in the People Also Ask element in the SERPs. So let's say they took, I don't know, rental properties or saved down rental properties and popped it in there. They'd be able to see what Google is showing in the People Also Asked element. And they're nearly always long tail because they're questions. Uh, and if you write to those, if you look for those and you write content targeting those questions, there's a good chance that you might pick up some featured snippets or appear in the PAA, the People Also Ask element. Uh, and that's a, quite a nice way to get some easy traffic. Well. All right. Anybody else on this one? Excellent. Uh, uh, and uh, okay. Chris Green asked a question titled uh, Search Engine Optimization for Search Filtered Result Pages. Uh, Chris said, Hi, guys. We have a site where, where the developers are adding custom filters for an e commerce store. Um, what are uh, SEO quick things to look at um, for when dealing with e-commerce filters? One we have is reviewing if filters have canonical tags uh, pointing to parent categories. I can give you a little bit of experience or example from my experience working with this one. This can be a real nightmare. And um, most people, they underestimate what type of crawl space, even a small catalog. If you start off with, with 40 products and each product's got 20 attributes, and if you work out how many variations there are, if you offer all those, those attributes as facets, it's a just a, it's an enormous figure. You'd be just it's an amazing sort of crawl paths you can build with this that generally you don't want. And um, one of the ways that I have worked with a couple of sites to manage this is to only allow single facets be indexed. So only provide URLs for individual facets. And once a user adds two or more facets. You basically handle it client side with JavaScript and URL fragments. And Google will ignore the URL fragments. They won't crawl them. They'll only ever see uh, the URLs that you've set up for each individual facet. And let's say your, your index page for this section of the site. And um, there are ways to do it. Uh, it's not trivial. It's quite difficult to, to, to implement this properly. Um, but on larger sites, this can be an utter nightmare, and you can absolutely drain your crawl budget with, with a section of your site that uses faceted search. Um, so it's well worth trying to implement something with. And like I said, even a small number of pages or a small number of facets, you suddenly have a huge, huge body of crawl path. Um, it's, it's quite, it can be quite monstrous. So that's one way to do it that I know of. Thank you, Richard. Um, anybody else? Okay, and I'd also like to point out uh, people like Dave Elliott and uh, Stockbridge Truslow who uh, answer questions uh, through the week and make uh, WCA questions such a valuable uh, resource. All right, number four on our run list. Um, it's titled Two Homepage uh, URLs in the Google Search Console. It's from Olivia Rose. Olivia said, uh, hi, everyone. The homepage of my website is showing up as two different URLs in Google Search Console. 
Um, that's um, www.hcwtp. Um, I'm not sure if it's showing like that, is it? Um, anyway, um, it's just, I attached a screenshot for reference. Does anyone know how I can make the URL with the most views my canonical uh, URL and redirect the other version of my URL to that one? I didn't check this one. Um, doesn't it, it, it sh surely doesn't um, put uh, www.hwtp as full colon slash slash, does it? No, it seems to me that one is HTTPS and the other one's an HTTP. So one yeah. second, one isn't. Okay. Does yes. that mean using a domain property here? You know, you have domain properties in, in Google Search Console where you put it put in the domain and it just it pulls everything in, whether whatever subdomains it's on and everything else just pops into this into a profile. It's a sort of newer thing they have in, in Google Search Console, I think. It's not like us old timers. We're used to just adding a property. You have to use to, to add a property for HTTP. You have to add a separate property for HTTPS. Mm. And then they introduce this domain property, which is one of these things where you drop in your domain. You just drop in domain.com, and it picks up everything goes under that, I think, automatically. And that's probably what he's looking at. Uh-huh. Canonical and redirect. Hmm. All right, let's call this one asked and answered and we'll go to the next. Uh, this one from Chris Green, it's, it's titled multiple uh, H1 tags containing the same keyword. Um, Chris said, hi guys, uh, if a page has multiple uh, H1 tags containing the same keyword or a close variation, uh, would you recommend uh, removing one of the H1 tags and shifting it to an H2 tag? Also, would you classify this as a high, medium, or low technical issue or te priority, I guess is what he means? Well, I think the, the issue is not so much to do with the H1 tags and the H2 tags, but to uh, what's, what's happening with the, the keywords. Um, how... Is this some kind of semi-spammy issue? Let's be let, let's be blunt about it. You know what? How many of these key phrases have you got in it? Um, how often do they occur? Um, that that might be your problem. Now, since HTML5, I'm told by people who know about these things, you can have uh, multiple H1 tags. So having more than one isn't an issue. Um, shift it to an H2 tag therefore won't give you much uh, much goodness or badness. Um, so I would say the, it, the question about classifying this as a high, medium, or low technical issue is to do with what this is. If it's to do with the number of H1 tags, it doesn't matter. Um, if it's to do with how many keywords you're st sticking on the page, stuffing into the page, then it might be. Um, that that would be my uh, my response to it. Um, I personally, I don't like having more than one H one tag on a page because of how it makes the page look and how easy or difficult it is to read it. But there's no technical reason to have uh, just one. Thank you, David. Um, any other comments on this one? All right, let's charge on to number six on our run list. This one from Nathan Nikolai Gady. Uh, it's titled, Do I Need to Submit an HTML Sitemap? Um, and the question is, he goes on to say, uh, do I need to submit an HTML sitemap to Google just as I do XML maps? Um, you don't need to do 
either an HTML sitemap or an XML uh, sitemap. Um, certainly, if you've got a small site, um, Google will sort it out without a sitemap. If you've got a big, if you've got a big site, XML sitemap is a good good thing. I think I, I, think I read somewhere that um, that Google was not uh, um, not that bothered about HTML sitemaps at all but i'm trying to rack my brains as well i read that whether that was a a proper google um announcement or whether it was just a a, a something someone said um but maybe someone else can uh, can uh, uh answer that okay yeah i think they said something like your site shouldn't need a HTML sitemap. Like it's not gonna, unless there's something wrong with your site, and if there's something wrong with your site, you should just fix the site rather than be creating HTML sitemaps. I think they just said it's not gonna do, it make a whole lot of difference. It'd be quite good for UX though, and never, never forget that they're probably monitoring various sort of, various metrics which, which might relate to, to UX and user intent and 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 uh, you know intent completion that type of stuff. So if people spend more time on your site, it might have a, a secondary effect on your on your ranking and your SEO. So yeah, thank you. All right, um, let's go to uh, we we have answered that. Um, haven't we? Um, if you have a small site, really, you've got better things to do than worry about um, a site map. All right, um, question seven on our run list. We're charging through these. Um, James Chin wants to know, should I build links by submitting articles to other sites? Um, James said, uh, hi, I've just set up a new website and I'm new in this SEO thing. I read that writing article content and backlinking to my website will help in ranking, uh, but also duplicate uh, content uh, in uh, different websites uh, um, is no good. So do I have to write different content for my website and um, the other um, blog accounts, e-zine e articles or Twitter, or should I just focus uh, on my website and share to Facebook and Twitter? So this is the way I would go about this if you have no kind of experience in link building. Okay. I would spend the time because on your site, you know about that business, right? So I would spend some time working on the content, your own site, like really good stuff. Okay. Um, obviously you put, you know, once it's published, you know, it's, you know, you're working with that on social media, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and build up a little bit of sort of, you know, uh, authority around that, you, the subject, publishing some good stuff on your site. Um, and people will approach you, you know, whether it be, contributing for a webinar or an article or whatever, whatever, you know, it tends to follow you when you start um, pushing some good stuff out there. So your site will benefit straight away anyway from the, the, the better stuff you're putting on the site. Um, and then you need to do a little bit of your own marketing of that itself, the site and yourself whether you do that on social, whether you've involved in some groups online in the same genre. Um, and that, that will start attracting its own, you know, its own sort of thing. Um, I would do it that way personally. I 
Thank you, Tim. Uh, all right. Um, I see da David. Yeah, yes, David. Uh, we, we see that uh, there's some difficulties in the broadband network in uh, sunny West Sussex. Okay. All right. Let's uh, go to our next. This is one for another one from Nathan Nikolai Gady. Uh, and the negative effects of URL masking and path forwarding. Um, he said um, uh, URL masking and or forwarding path uh, is of negative effect, question mark. Here you go ahead. I'm only going to say masking is so old school. I wonder what type of hosting he's on. Uh -huh. It's really, really, it's something from yonks and yonks ago. And I think most masking, and I presume it's still the same. I didn't even know it still existed, but I presume it's still generally done with an iframe. So what you did, what the, what your hosting provider is doing, the server is basically it's sending out an iframe on on your domain, and there's a single frame in there, which is uh, the frame site of the masked site. And as you navigate around the masked site, the URL in the address bar doesn't change because the it's the address in the in the frame that's changing, so you don't see it. But um, I don't know why there'd be any reason to use this, and certainly it's not going to do you any good for SEO or anything like that. So. I mean, if you, I, I just don't know what the use case is here. There may be a use case for it that makes sense, but from a search perspective, like, do you don't want to do it? It's, it's not going to do you any good. Yeah. Excellent. Um, okay, let's look at our last question for the night. Um, this one is from again from Nathan Nikolai Gady. It's titled Mobile Friendly Sites uh, Rank Higher uh, Only for Mobile Searches. And that's with a question mark. Michael Martinez kicked off saying not exactly. Come on, guys, don't fight over this. Yeah, so mobile friend, yeah, well, no, because I still occasionally chuck in a search query uh, off the top of my head, corner, you know, and I will still get the first site, second site, and maybe even third are not even mobile friendly sites. And when you click on it, you know, in your, in your mobile, Google then says, uh, fit to page and you know they 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 try to make it you know obviously more a bit, a bit better and there are still you know there are still sites out there which are not mobile friendly that do pretty well for themselves um but i would still no nah, yeah so but i would still say that in the age of mobile first well, I, you know, I don't actually know. I, yeah, yeah well, it makes sense. Look, it makes sense that it would be better. But on a definitive, can you say yes or no, 100%, da, 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 I'm like, well, I'm thinking it depends on the query. In a high, in a high value query, I think a mobile friendly site would possibly be above a non mobile friendly site. But I couldn't say 100% on that. And you know what? The opposite is true also, that a mobile-friendly site could work well on desktop and can also appear in desktop searches. Even if it's a mobile-only site, it can still appear yeah. in desktop. Yeah. If, there aren't, so if, it's a good, if it's a really good result, like Google's going to show it to you, even if it's sort of got a, 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 a yeah. giant layout on desktop, they'll still show it. So, but There's still... Yeah, there's still some massive sites out there that have two two versions. 
I think still though, in this day and age, like you don't want to be like anyone who goes out to get a, a site built, designed or built, developed, whatever. Like the idea, if someone comes back to you and offers you a site that only works on desktop, like that's, you know, that's that's not going to work for you in this day and age. So you need your site to be mobile friendly, I suppose, because you're probably going to be getting, you're probably going to see like 50% of your traffic is going to be mobile. So and it'd be daft not to have a mobile friendly site in this day and age. You mean uh, having a, a, a second mobile site? Well, no, no. I mean, it could be, it could be, you know, it could be a responsive web design site. It could be a mobile first responsive. I mean, it doesn't. I mean, there's different ways of doing it. So, it's just a matter of making sure that your content is available, you know, on smaller interfaces and larger interfaces. Whether it's two separate sites, which I would generally not go for in this day and age, if you can at all avoid it. And God, it's a horrible SEO job working on on M dots or you know any sort of mobile alternative sites. It's it's painful. Uh, basically, if you can do it with, with with responsive web design, that's the way to go. Yeah, yeah, I I, I can um, um, offer something on 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 this because uh, I've been always been a fan of. Having a separate site, and and, and one thing that um, stands out to me is that if you do have an M dot site, um, it, it it tends to gather up uh, a different set of keywords um, than your you know dub 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 uh, desktop site. Um, so you know um, for that you, you're getting more coverage. You, you're presenting uh, your site uh, more. Um, so there's always that. Anyway, let's go to, oh, yes, it's, it's um, that time again. It is. It's thank you for watching time. I'd like to thank um, David and Masataki and Richard and uh, Tim uh, um, for turning up tonight, as always, and uh, um, helping uh, to review the uh, um, questions asked on the uh, dumb seo questions facebook group um, we'll be back uh, at the same time next week um, to do this uh, all again um, and uh, and until then um, it's uh, good night let me see what I'm, what I'm doing wrong here how can i stop this there we are